Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. The message for today, and we're calling this Lost and Found, and we've been in a series for a couple weeks now in a New Testament book called Galatians. And this book is about one primary thing, and it is the heart of God that reaches down to people who without the love and the pursuit of God would be lost. But God in his amazing grace has come to them. It is really a story from beginning to end about lost and found. And today, if we put our hope and trust in the Jesus of the Bible, you know what? We were lost. But now we've been found, and it is his doing. I don't know if you like some lost and found stories. There's some pretty amazing ones out there. And I want to show you a brief one by way of video here. Check this out. I got a phone call from my, um, my nephew's wife, and she was like, by chance, did you lose a pocketbook 20 years ago? And I was like, yes. April Bolt thought these items were lost for good. More than two decades ago, she was carrying her 15-month-old son while getting off a boat, but left her purse behind. There was a couple of guys fishing, so I figured they would you know, be, be able to watch things for me. So we walked up, had dinner, came back, the purse was gone. Inside were credit cards, makeup, baby pictures, and even her high school diploma. 25 years later, this 11-year-old boy who was fishing on the same lake where she lost her belongings reunited them. My rod tip was bending, and then when I got it up to the surface, me and Ben were like, well, well you ain't got fish yet, you got treasure. And I was in total disbelief. I couldn't believe it. After 25 years, what are the chances of getting a first back? Remarkably, most of the items stayed intact, even the lipstick. It's still in great condition. It's crazy how 25 years, it's still pretty in pink. I got a phone call from a... A purse lost at the bottom of a lake and found 25 years later by somebody who hooked it when they were fishing. Jesus loved to tell some lost and found stories. And maybe you're familiar on the day in which he told three of them, and we're going to look at them today, but just to illustrate that Jesus talked about this and it mattered to him. He talked about a lost sheep. He talked about a lost coin. He talked about a lost son. Lost and found by the grace of God. At the heart of every faith story is a grace story. That anybody who has come to that place where they put their hope and trust in him, it is God's grace that has brought them to that point. It is God's doing from beginning to end. And why does this matter? Because the letter that we call Galatians in the New Testament, there was this debate about what does it really take for people to be in a relationship with God? And Jesus is great and his grace is great, but then you need to get busy and you need to do your part. God does his part and then you do your part. And somewhere those two things meet in the middle. And the Apostle Paul writes this letter called Galatians to say, that's not it at all. You can't add anything to what Jesus has done for you. Nothing. At the heart of every faith story is a grace story. Let me tell you um, one of those stories. Maybe you've heard of somebody named Anne Lamott. Put a picture of her up on the screen here. And she is somebody who details uh, her journey of faith to God in a book called Traveling Mercies. And she tells a little bit of her own story there. And I want to read this, and hopefully the wind won't blow it away. She um, talks about growing up back in the 60s, and if you weren't around then, that was the time of a lot of different things going on, and including hallucinogenic drugs and things like that. Anybody remember something called Woodstock? Um, 
you know, and the old joke goes, if you remember Woodstock, you weren't there, because if you were there, you don't remember it, you know, for all those um, reasons that I already talked about. And so Anne grew up in a home where her parents were pretty much atheists, and they were into the whole thing of expanding their mind and everything that came along with that. She got involved in drinking and drugs, was an alcoholic, and yet her life, for the most part, was functioning really well. And then she tells this story, her story, in Traveling Mercies. And this is shortly after she went through getting an abortion. She says, one night I got into bed too shaky, sad, too wild to have another drink or take another sleeping pill. So I had a cigarette and turned off the light. After a while as I lay there, I became aware of someone with me hunkered down in the corner. I was feeling so, uh, so strong, the feeling was so strong, I actually turned on the light to make sure no one was there. And of course there wasn't. But after a while, in the dark again, I felt it again. I knew without a shadow of a doubt, it was Jesus. And she goes on to talk about how she lived on a houseboat, and about 200 yards away from there, there was a church, and she would go there on occasion on Sunday morning. She was walking by one day, and she heard the music, and the music just drew her in. And it was a primarily African-American church, and she loved the music. And then every week, she would get up, and she would leave before the message. And I hear that around here a lot, too. Uh, but no, that was part of her experience. And so she had this awareness, but then it was kind of like just about the music. But on that day, she knew without a doubt it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I feel my dog lying nearby as I write this. And I was appalled. I thought of my life and my brilliant, hilarious, progressive friends. I thought of what everyone would think of me if I became a Christian. And it seemed an utterly impossible thing that could not be allowed to happen. I turned to the wall and said out loud, I would rather die. I felt him just sitting there in his haunches watching me, patient, in love. And I squished my eyes shut. But that did not help because that's not what I was seeing him with. Finally, I fell asleep, and in the morning, he was gone. This experience spooked me badly, and I thought it was just an apparition born of fear, self-loathing due to her abortion and booze. And everywhere she went the following week, she felt that she was being followed. And then she says this. A week later, when I went back to church, so hungover I could barely stand, I stayed for the sermon, which I thought was so ridiculous, like someone was trying to convince me of the existence of extraterrestrials. But that last song was so deep, raw, and pure, I could not escape. Something was rocking me in its bosom, rocking me like a scared kid. And I opened up to the feeling, and it washed over me. I began to cry, and, and I left before the benediction. I raced home, opened the door of my houseboat, and I yelled out. And I can't tell you what she said, because it's not polite language in church. But then she also said, I quit. And I took a long, deep breath, and I said out loud, all right, you can come in. And this was the beautiful moment of my conversion. And the story of Anne Lamont, you know, we would think, man, that's a really great story. She went on to be interviewed by some radios uh, programs in the weeks and months and years to follow. And almost every time that she was on and she talked about her story, because, because along with her uh, story of conversion, her politics are very different, you know, than most people. And sometimes when she was being interviewed on radio programs, followers of Jesus would call in and tell her that without a doubt she was going to hell because of her politics and because she didn't have all her theology worked out. And that's the situation that was happening in Galatia. It's the reason that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. Because there were some people saying, you know what, you don't have it all right. You didn't you didn't really complete the whole thing. Paul gave you a watered-down version of what it means to belong to God, but now it's up to you, and we have the list of things that you need to do, because starting with grace is great, but you haven't finished. God did his part. Now you, you got to do your part, and so we're here to tell you what that looks like, and Paul writes this letter. And here's what he said, and we looked at this um, a couple weeks ago. I'm astonished that you are so quickly turning from God's grace to follow another gospel. Not that there is one. How many gospels are there according to Apostle Paul? There's just one. And what does that mean, the gospel? We are hopelessly lost. 
God has come to our rescue and accomplished everything necessary for us to belong to him, we need to receive his grace. And we need to live inside of that relationship together with him. And then Paul goes on to share his faith story, his lost and found story. And let's take a look at a couple of these verses here as we journey through this. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not the man's gospel, is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And you notice what he says, that he received it. This wasn't something that he thought up. This wasn't man's idea. It wasn't something that was created here about how we can get to God. But instead, the gospel is all about God in his love and his grace coming from where he is all the way down to us. And Paul wants to make it clear. Look, there's nothing on the human level when we talk about lost and found that we do to have ourselves become found. It is God's doing. His grace comes all the way to us. And that's what separates faith in the Jesus of the Bible from any other faith that there is because religion is advice about how you and I can work our way to God. What the gospel is, is God in his grace and his love and primarily through the person and the work of Jesus Christ working his way all the way to you and me. And so Paul wants to say, hey, you know what? You want to know my story? I received it. I didn't accomplish it. I didn't do anything special. I didn't do anything great even to be where I am to write you this letter or all the time that we spent together. It was all God's doing from beginning to end. And you know what? It's been that way from the very beginning. We see this in the early part of the Bible all the way back in the book of Genesis when God places a man and a woman in a garden where they had everything that they could possibly desire. But one day they decide, you know what, God's keeping something from us. And so we're going to launch out and do our own thing because we can actually have more by stepping across the boundary that God has put in place. They rebelled against God and instantly the connection and the relationship that they had was broken. The Bible described it this way before that moment they walked with God on a daily basis. Can you imagine what it was like to have everything that was not broken, everything at your disposal, everything that you could ever desire and then to come to the conclusion, you know what? It's not enough. And God hasn't given us everything. So now it's up to us and we'll do it. And you know what's on the other side of that? The man and the woman, they decide to hide. And God comes looking for them as he did every day, but he can't find them because they are hiding. And God seeks them out. They're not looking for God. They're looking to run away from God. And God continues to pursue them. And when he asks, hey, what happened? The man says, well, the woman that you gave me. And then she says, well, the serpent deceived me, which some have said set in motion a pattern that's been going ever since. A husband will blame his wife and the wife will say the devil made me do it. But there was a brokenness on the other side of that. And they're kicked out of that garden, away from the tree of life. And what does God do on the other side of that to the people who have just rebelled and, and said, God, you, you're not having our best interests at heart. You're keeping something from us. What does God do? He goes out into his perfect creation and he kills an animal and takes its skin and uses that to cover them. And God responds to the rebellion of people by pursuing them and loving them in spite of themselves. A little bit later, maybe you're familiar with a guy named Abraham, and God comes to Abraham one day and says, I'm going to create a great nation through you, and one day there will be one, a Messiah, who will come through that nation. Was Abraham looking in God's direction? Was Abraham saying, you know, I'm going to get my life right, and I'm going to do all the right things, so God views me with favor and uses me in a powerful way? No, there's no indication that Abraham had done anything in God's direction. God just chooses him. Why? Because he's in pursuit of people who are far from God. They are lost, and he is seeking them. He is looking to find them. 
And we see that pattern over and over and over again. And this is usually when somebody might say something like this, but Roy, are you saying then that what we do doesn't matter? How about things like the Ten Commandments? Are you saying that, that they don't matter? But here's the thing. You take the example of the Ten Commandments. They were never given as a bar so that people could jump that high, and if they do, then they've done their part and they've been made right with God. Because you look at the Ten Commandments and God went into a nation that was enslaved. There was nothing they could do to free themselves. What does God do? God frees them through his power and his grace. He comes all the way down to them and does everything to set them free. And then on the other side of delivering them, on the other side of them becoming his people in a personal way, he gives them the Ten Commandments. But they were given to people inside of a relationship with God. They're not how we get to God. It's when God finds us. How do we live in response to that? How do we honor him? How do we live with each other in ways that are honoring to the God who has rescued us? So yeah, the Ten Commandments, they're important. They still stand. But they never were and they never will be a way that any person can make themselves right with God or add anything to what God has done. And so Paul says, grace is God's idea. I received it. I didn't accomplish it. He goes on in his faith story in verse 13. He says, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father's. And maybe this is why this was so clear to Paul, because he talks about being zealous and how he talks about persecuting the church. Do you know the backstory of Paul? He was part of a group called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees was a really strict group. And if you know anything about the Bible, they're not in the Old Testament. And all of a sudden, there they are in the New Testament. And we might wonder, well, where did they come from? There's a 400-year gap between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And in that gap, there was a group of different nations that came through and they conquered Israel. Alexander the Great and the Greeks came through and they conquered that area. Then came the Romans and they conquered through that area as well. All these different pagan cultures were coming through. And so some people in Israel with the right heart, the right intentions, the right motives said, you know, we need to get back to what it means to belong to the God of the Bible, the God who has rescued us. And so let's get serious about our faith. And so there's a group of people that wind up becoming a group called the Pharisees. They said, let's identify all the different commands that God has given us and let's keep them. Let's get serious about our faith. By the time Jesus comes along, there are 613 commands. And there are 248 things to do and 365 things not to do. There is a don't for every day of the year. And the idea was, you know, it began with a really good thought. But that great intention was gone when Jesus was there, and he had this difficulty with the Pharisees because it came all about what I can do to keep all the rules that we had put in place, even adding to the things that God has given to us. And so by the time Jesus comes, the heart of it was really lost. And the intention began good, but it didn't stay there. It became something that ultimately became about our performance. And so when Paul was a Pharisee, you know what his job was? It was to exterminate this brand new thing called the church because they were saying, you know what, all those rules, it's about Jesus, not those rules. And so Paul was kind of a little bit like James Bond. He had a license to kill and he was using it. And he was exterminating people who had put hope and faith in the Jesus of the Bible. And then one day, as he's on his way to do that same thing and to take some people out, God appears to him in a dramatic way. And he hears a voice, and it's Jesus' voice, and he says, I'm the one that you're persecuting, Paul. And his whole life changed that day. And maybe when somebody realizes how lost they are, maybe that's why they just can understand how amazing that rescue becomes. 
That's why Paul says, you know what? Not a whole lot of good here. When anything good in my life. And what sometimes can mislead us and get a little confusing for people like us is that we think that maybe God could use somebody like on us on a, his team. But the reality is we are all hopelessly lost without the grace of God. It's a lost and found story where God does all of the finding. He goes on in his story in verse 15, but he who has set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him uh, among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Do you notice what he said in verse 15? He who had set me apart before I was born. Here's the amazing thing about God in Paul's life. He knew every day of Paul's life. The days when he was out trying to exterminate this whole message of grace, thing called the church. And you know what? What's true about Paul is true about you. There's a God who saw you the moment you were conceived. A God who has seen every moment of your life, the good, the bad, the ugly. There's a God who knows everything about us. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And there's a God who's pursuing you. And there's a God who loves you many times in spite of you, in spite of me. And so Paul's story, and really every story that is a faith story, is really a grace story from beginning to end. And it can become a dangerous thing when here where we live, we think, you know what, there's something that I have to do in order to add to what Jesus has done for me. Because it's his story and his doing. Paul continues and he says these words um, beginning in verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brothers. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. For they were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. When people who had been running from Paul because he was trying to kill them discovered that Paul was now a follower of the Jesus of the Bible as well. What was their conclusion? Paul, you're a really good guy who has gotten his act together. No, it says that they glorified God. That they understood that when any life turns around, it is God's doing. It is a lost and found story where God has done the searching. Grace is God's idea. Grace is God's work. And any credit for grace only goes to God. I don't know about your story of coming to faith. You know, for me, I was raised around faith. And for a long time, I was kind of straddling both sides of, you know, being somebody who went to church mainly because I had to, but also doing my own things. And the moment in which I crossed that line of faith, was at a youth retreat, and my friend and I smuggled beer into this youth retreat, and we're going to do that, you know, out at night. But that night, before we were getting ready to go out and drink our beer, there was a service where they had communion, and we were invited to come up and talk about our love and really just acknowledge our love for God. And in that moment, I knew I couldn't do it. Was I looking for God that day? Nope. Resonate a little bit with Anne Lamott's story that I was just kind of doing my own thing and thought I had it all figured out. But God finds us, even when we're not looking for him. Grace is his idea. Grace is God's work. And any credit for grace only goes to God. Anne Lamott's story, Paul's face story, I want to show you one other story of somebody here at Washington Heights and their moment of coming to that place 
of trusting God's grace. Check out Jerry's story. So in my mid-20s, I uh, found myself in a bar in Texas and uh, I met up with some guys at the bar and um, we just decided to go out from there and uh, continue to party on and long story short, I ended up uh, really drunk and passed out at one of their houses. I woke up in the morning and uh, I found myself lying on the ground. I had fallen through a plate glass mirror. I woke up in the pile of glass and I didn't have a scratch on me. I couldn't figure it out then. I was still a little dazed and, you know, it just kind of continued to bug me all day long of, of how I could fall through that glass and not, and not get cut, not get scratched. It kind of clued me into a little bit of my own mortality. And so I started to question the why of life. Um, why am I here? Why am I doing this? That night, there was a huge thunderstorm. It was lightning everywhere. It was raining really hard and I just decided I had to get the noise out of my head. So I went out and I just had it out with God, man. I, I screamed in the rain, I screamed through the lightning. I dared him to strike me down, to take me out. And this is as somebody that professed to be an atheist at the time, I didn't even believe in God. And through all of that, I ended up back at my trailer and the storm quit. And I just had a peace and a calm that came over me. I kind of decided right there, okay, God, you know, if you're real, I'm going to need something in my life that shows me that you're really there and that you really care about me. Two weeks later, I met my wife. She was a lifelong Christian, and so she started to uh, urge me to, to go to church. At first, I was very apprehensive, but the music was pretty good. It was upbeat and contemporary, and so I decided that it was something I could continue doing. I had decided at some point that I was gonna accept Jesus, prayed the sinner's prayer, and I really started to believe in, in most of it, but I wasn't ready to give up all the control in my life. I wasn't trusting that he really was who he said he was and that uh, he was really gonna take care of me. Fast forward a little bit, uh, I found myself uh, in a hospital room. My wife was pregnant. We'd just been told that they were gonna have to do an emergency C-section the doctors didn't know if they were gonna be able to save either her or my son's life. The whole family was praying together. I remember just this calm that was in this room. It was a peace beyond all understanding. We didn't have a fear, we didn't have a worry. And in that moment when we were praying for my wife and son, I just had the knowledge hit me that I wasn't in control, that it wasn't about me and that I really needed to lay everything down and give everything to God because He is in control. And that's the moment when I laid my yes down for Jesus. Jerry had his own real life Lieutenant Dan moment. You know what I'm talking about from Forrest Gump? Right, where he's screaming at this storm and at God. And I think Jerry's story, like mine, and like some others, not even looking for God, but you know what? He's looking for you. And here's just a couple ways maybe to apply what we've been talking about. And again, at the heart of every faith story is a grace story. And if you've already put your hope and your trust in the Jesus of the Bible and you've discovered that grace, I hope and pray that there would be this sense of gratitude in our hearts that would never go away. Because God didn't need us, but he loves us. And so he rescued us from beginning to end. And may we not think ever that there is something that we can do to add to what Jesus has done. We were lost. He found us. It's his grace. And I think also if we are in that relationship with him, may we join him in what he's doing. Well, what is God doing in this world? Many things. One of them is that he's pursuing people who matter so much to him. And could there be times and ways in which even we need to set aside our own preferences, our own ideas, and and to just be part of what God is doing in 
reaching more people who matter so much to him. If you've not yet stepped across that line of faith and trust, I hope you know one thing, that there's a God who loves you. And he saw your first moment. He has seen every moment of your life. And he invites you to come to him. And you may not have been looking for him, but he's looking for you. And where we've been and what we've done, that's not his concern. When Jesus came to Paul, he didn't recount his past and all list all the things that he had done to work against what God was doing. He just invited him to come. And you can do that as well. Ben is going to lead us in a song called Reckless Love. And this is a song that sometimes people say, I'm not so sure about that wording because God's love is not reckless. But what it's meaning to communicate to us is that God's love is so extravagant, will go so far, it, it seems downright reckless. But that's the heart of God for you. And we have the opportunity to celebrate that no matter where we are in these next couple moments. Would you let me pray? And then the band's going to lead us. So God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for lost and found stories because in reality, every single one of us, we're like a lost person in the bottom of a lake, hopelessly lost. But your love finds us wherever we are. You meet us right where we are. And God, you bring us to yourself. And so God, in these moments, may these hearts of ours celebrate, marvel, wonder at the love of God that has reached down to us. And so God, we thank you for your great love for us. And may all of this be about you. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.